All right, everybody, welcome in to another edition of the Auburn Live Football Show. I'm Justin Hokinson, joined as always by Cole Pinkston. Cole, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing good. I'm kind of jealous, actually, because I wasn't able to make it to that practice. And Hugh Freeze just decided everybody gets to stay for the entire practice. <laughs> Been hoping for the whole time, but hey, it is what it is, I guess. I know. That was surprising um, late last week. That was surprising. And what was funny about that was – he was not thrilled during the press conference. So that was the day that we oh. reported Peyton Thorne, and then we did the presser, and he wasn't super happy that the quarterback news got out. He probably wanted to do it his own way, whatever. And then, uh, and then he was mad about some 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 other outlet. I don't I don't even really know what happened, but so, somebody put a video out um, that in, that included a cadence at some point, and apparently. Uh, they weren't happy about that. And so he brought that up at his press conference. He was like, well, if you guys would just stop posting videos, you're like, well, we're out there. We're going to post videos. And then he kind of specified like of the cadence kind of thing. So anyway, he just went, and I almost wonder if that was why, like he was a little bit annoyed. And I almost wonder if he then went out there and decided to sort of like good cop, bad cop it and be like, all right, I kind of got onto him now. Like I'm just going to let him watch practice a little bit. Um, yeah. No if, it, if it was, it was smart. It was smart. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I've never, I mean, I, in all the years I've covered, I've never watched an entire practice. Just let, I've never been out there and then just be like, yeah, you can watch an entire fall practice, fall camp practice. That's never happened um, that I remember. Well, I think he knows with the media that he's pretty lenient about a lot of things and how, you know, how open it is, especially for us with recruiting. I mean, we sit up there in the lobby, you know, and wait for guys. And he seems to like that because he gets, you know, we get interviews out there of the guys and all that, but, you know, a guy like, you know, letting it be so open, I'm sure he's like, you know, if I tell you to do something, make sure you do it. <laughs> and then I'll let you have an entire practice. Stuff like that. You know? Yeah. Um, it was cool. We're going to talk about that real quick. Um, give a quick shout out to our main sponsor, Session Cocktail. Appreciate them being a, a part of the show and supporting what we do at Auburn Live and supporting this show, Session Cocktail in downtown Auburn. Um, they're located right there on Magnolia, right next to Taco Mama. Go check them out. Um, really cool vibe environment. Um, some booth seating and bar seating and couch seating and really a comfortable environment to go have a nice cocktail. They have happy hour four to six. They have really gold, good old fashions. Um, they do a cocktail for the, for a cause every month. So go check that out where, you know, whatever that cocktail is, it'll support a charity. So that changes every month. So good people at Session Cocktail in downtown Auburn. Go check them out, please. They'll be a popular spot on game days. I think if you're in on game days, Man, if you're you're walking around tailgating, if you're walking around downtown, just walk right in. Um, you know, grab a drink. They've got a couple TVs. Um, sit on the couch for a minute, get out of the sun, and then go back out and 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 keep walking around. That's a good spot to do that as well. So, session cocktail. Appreciate them supporting um, the show. All right, Cole. Let's talk about uh, the scrimmage. The final scrimmage on Saturday this is the final day of fall camp. Then they'll take a couple days off as classes get rolling, and then they'll get into the season. I mean, they got this week and then next week. Um, I mean, they'll probably start to get into some kind of routine this week. Media wise, we, we won't, we'll get into our stuff probably, you know, next week and it'll be game week. Just crazy. Literally we're, we're two weeks from the first game, but uh, they had that final scrimmage on Saturday inside Jordan Hare stadium. We have a lot of news and notes from that scrimmage up at auburnlive.com. A bunch of takeaways from what Hugh Freeze said, um, things like that. Um, I think I think one of the probably the biggest maybe the biggest takeaway was just Hugh Freeze talking about the lack of energy for the second scrimmage. He said he's not sure why. He said practice energy is great, and then we go over there inside the stadium for both scrimmages, and it hasn't been where he wants it to be uh, for whatever reason. We can talk about that. Um, it sounded like they tried to open it up a little bit offensively. Peyton Thorne threw 17 passes. Robbie threw 15. Gurner threw I think 10 or 11. Um, they tried to open it up a little bit, but um, what are what are maybe some of your thoughts um, from what you read and heard uh, from that from that final scrimmage on on Saturday? Uh, well, I, I think it's it's obviously a very good thing that he is pointing out the energy level. That's good. He'll call him out a little bit. He's a really nice guy, Hugh Freeze. Um, even if you had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, he's about as nice as he can be. But if something's not going the right way, 
you, you wonder, okay, how nice is he? Do you, do you want him to be the nicest guy in the world if he's the head coach? You know what I mean? But when he gets in these situations, and you can tell his demeanor sort of changed. Honestly, his, his demeanor has been happy-go-lucky all throughout the recruiting season when, when you know, Jeffrey and I have seen him at the complex and when he's spoken, uh, even in spring camp. But his demeanor is different. Uh, his body language is different. He seems a little bit more focused to me. He's uh, he's calling people out a little bit. I, I like that. I, I wanted to see that side of him, and and I never really studied him too closely when he was at Ole Miss, at least in those kind of ways. So I didn't know, you know, if he had that that side to him, and he's and he does. Uh, that's probably why he's been successful in a lot of places because he has no problem calling you out. He has no problem, you know, hoping getting everything right. So I think that's good. Heard good things about Peyton Thorne again. Um, Heard good things about the offensive line. I think they handled the pass rush a little bit better this time and gave the quarterbacks more time. Not as many sacks, from what I understand, on the other side. So that probably means to me, I don't think your pass rushers got any worse from one Saturday to the next. So it probably means your pass protection got a little bit better and they cleaned some things up. That's good, especially if you're trying to throw it a lot and you got a guy like Shane Hooks making these highlight reel catches out there. That makes that makes play calling a little bit easier if you know that he can make those kind of catches and those plays, um, because then it's very simple. You just throw it to him, get him in a one on one matchup. You don't have to think that hard. Neither does quarterback. So I like seeing that kind of stuff come out of that scrimmage. What do you think goes into the um, the energy level thing? I mean, it's kind of hard to put your finger on it. I, I, I was thinking about it when he said it, like, why is that not translating? And, you know, I don't know, maybe there there's a comfort level on the practice field. The music's blaring. It's really loud. It's a little bit more closed in and confined. Maybe they go over there in the stadium and it's just, it's a little more wide open. And um, I don't know, the focus isn't there. Maybe the attention to detail isn't quite there, the, maybe the way it is. Like you get in a stadium and everything's a little bit more spread out. I mean, you're on the sidelines and everybody's practice field can feel a little bit closer. I don't, I don't know. And maybe it's a little more focused and maybe the energy, the way that practice field, everything's set up, maybe that energy sort of stays in that place better. Whereas you go in the stadium and you can kind of get lost a little bit. If the fans aren't there, you can kind of get lost just sort of an empty cavernous stadium. Um, and so maybe that's why the energy is not quite translating over. I think it'll be different. Obviously, when there's fans in the stands, I think I think all that changes. So I don't I don't think it's anything to worry about in terms of the energy not going over. But kind of a bummer that they had two scrimmages, really the only two you're allowed to have in fall camp, and you come away and Hugh Freeze comes away and says I didn't like the energy in either one of them. I mean, you know, you hate to say like it's a wasted opportunity because I think guys you got stuff on film and I think guys got better or worse or whatever. I mean, there's things happened development happened but you hate to hear him say the energy wasn't where it needed to be in your only two opportunities to scrimmage over there that's that's kind of a bummer to hear i think the word energy kind of encompasses a lot of different things it's just an easy way to call it all together and say the energy's low but i think some of it has to do with that word strain you know we've heard that word strain a lot and they're putting strain on them in practice and doing all this but when you get to that point scrimmage point the guys feel like this is their – the guys who are in position battles trying to win a spot, they feel like this is their chance more than practice. I, I just know how it is. Been in that situation. I don't know why it is. You, you kind of anticipate that scrimmage all week like it's a game, and the coaches build it up like it's a game, and they, and they tell you, look, I mean, you know, this is where you go out there and perform. So there's pressure. It's just like what he was saying with Peyton Thorne uh, in the first scrimmage. He's, he's – uh, what was the word he used? He's uh, – Pressing. Pressing. I think a lot of guys are pressing right now because there's so many battles going on. So that might translate to low. It looks like low energy. What it probably is is I want to make sure I do everything right so I'm not going as fast as I pro probably could. I think that's what it is more than anything. Uh, just being a part of a football program and seeing how that goes and knowing the stress that a scrimmage can have, especially when there's position battles, I think that's what it is. Now you'll have some guys – like in the second scrimmage, who come out and go, I know what I'm doing now. I feel a lot better. I'm moving faster. It sounds like the offensive line did that. Um, so, obviously, the running backs, they continue to impress all of them. 
So they're they're feeling pretty comfortable. Once everybody starts to feel comfortable, I bet that energy level picks up too. I think it's synonymous. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and look, the energy thing, you know, in the first scrimmage, Hugh talked about, let's say, the receivers, where he thought there was maybe some loafing. That's that's some specific examples of, of an energy thing you could point to. I didn't necessarily hear that with this scrimmage. You know, he talked about the energy being low, but, but he didn't necessarily – say it was because I saw guys loafing or I saw guys doing X, Y, Z. So it could be a perception thing. I mean, he could just sort of perceived it because he even admitted after the game, he talked about, um, he talked about, uh, for instance, you've probably seen in the practice photos, they're wearing those guardian help, those guardian pads on their, on their helmets to obviously limit the contact and reduce head to head, you know, those helmets bashing, you're going to have plenty of that in the season. So for instance, he said at one point, he looked at Jake Thorne, Jake Thornton and asked, are we even coming off the ball? Cause like, I don't hear the helmets hitting. I don't, I don't like, I don't hear that. And so I don't, I don't, I don't like, are we even, are we even playing physical? And so it was kind of an admission to like, and it kind of makes me think about the energy thing. It could have been low energy. It also could have just been a perception thing from him. Like maybe, he just was perceiving it in a certain way. Maybe the energy wasn't as bad as he thought. I mean, who knows? Um, but it's, I think the energy in terms of like that is it's a little, little bit, um, I think subjective. Um, I, you know what? Energy is better than loaf. The word loaf is tough. That's, uh, a, yeah, that's, tough. A tough, that's a tough word, especially if you're a player and you hear that, that your coach said, Oh, they're loafing. That's yeah. not good. Low energy. Eh, you know, you can build off of that. Loafing is like, oh, I, I got to fix that right now. You know, I used to have a coach. He'd sit there and he'd, he'd just, while we're watching film, just be making tally marks on the board. He wouldn't say why. And then uh, film, you know, film session would be over and he'd go, all right, go put on your cleats. These are the uh, sprints we're running today from the loafs I saw on film. I'd be like, oh. okay, so loaf is a bad thing. It, it, it very quickly. Okay, that's a that's a word you want to avoid. So when I heard heard that word, it triggered in my mind like, oh, that's not good. That has to be fixed. And didn't hear that word in the second one. And I think that's important. Yeah. Um. You mentioned uh, you mentioned Shane Hooks. He he was he was the star of Saturday. No question about it. He caught at least two touchdowns. He had one in the in the first scrimmage. So he comes away with. Um, touchdowns in both scrimmages, I think at, at least three. He might have had three on Saturday. I can't remember. But, um, you know, the one-handed catch goes viral in the back of the end zone, which where I'm not sure he ever touched it with his left hand. It was impressive. No. Uh, it was an impressive grab. You know, he's a guy um, that I, I, I wrote about in July, and I know you feel the same way about him. And I wrote about him in July when I was doing my three predictions for the receivers. And one of my predictions was that, that Hooks would be – Auburn's best NFL prospect at receiver. Um, and it's taken him a little bit of time, I think, to get in there. I think when he first got there, he was swimming a little bit. But now that he's, I think, gotten a better understanding, his talent and all of those abilities are coming out. And, uh, and he's, he's, he's looked really, really good um, the last week, that scrimmage last week and then scrimmage. And I think clearly separated himself – as the best playmaker among those receivers, a lot of them will play, you know, until they get the rotation down, there'll be rotation and hooks will kind of bounce around. And I'm not saying hooks is going to get 10 grabs a game, but I think he's clearly separated himself as if Auburn needs a play yeah. right now, he, he, he'd be the guy. And it, it probably will be like that for a lot of the year. Now, they have some options. Jair Shorter is a big option. Rivaldo Fairweather is an option. But Hooks is going to be probably that guy more times than not that if they need a play, Peyton Thorne's going to be like, all right, no matter what's going on, I need to know where – I need to I need to pay attention to Shane Hooks and see where he's going first uh, because he's just 6'4", 190, giant hands. He's really started to emerge and be that guy. Now, what Freeze said is he's got to be consistent. He's like, I got to get him to play every down like you're going to get the ball, which is which happens in, in college, man. You get – you get these guys that if it's not if it's not to them or if they think it's not coming their way, they're they're not, you know, they're loafing a little bit, right? Like they're they're just they're not gonna quite put the same effort into it. And so he's like, we gotta get him, 
we got to get him running every route, every play, like it's going to him, like it's the last play of the game. Um, but that's that's something he's just going to have to work on. But from a talent perspective, he's making some plays, and that's what we've talked about at receiver. Like, who in the world is going to step up and be a playmaker? Looks like shit. You could throw Fairweather in there too. He's obviously he's a tight end, but from just simply the receivers, it looks like Hooks is is doing that. Yeah, and like like I said earlier, that makes your job as a play caller much easier. I believe Keith Niebuhr is the one who coined the phrase, or at least one of the times that I've heard it. It's amazing how play callers get better when you have really good players. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing how that works. Uh, so you want those guys to step up as playmakers. You got to have more playmakers than you did a year ago because that really hurts. Uh, and I, you know, whatever you want to say about the previous staff. I, I mean, I know how it is to try to call plays when you don't have playmakers. It is, you yeah. know, it's, it's tough. So uh, that's college, man. It's pros too. Pros is probably a little more scheming, but college, man, sometimes it's, I got a, I got a baller and you don't. And so I'm going to go to him. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember going to some coaching clinics when I was learning things, you know, in the coaching world and we'd be watching film and a guy would show us something and he'd be explaining the play and, and you'd sit down and you'd go. So it, it was just your guy that was good. It really wasn't anything crazy you drew up here. It's just your guy's good. He's better than the guy that he was going against. So Shane Hooks might be that guy is what I'm trying to say. And if that's the case, you have a go-to guy now. Somebody coined the phrase, you know, wide receiver one, question mark, after that one-handed catch came out. I, I don't know if he's wide receiver one, but he might He might be. He might be. Uh, I'm, I was on the same page as you. You were saying he had the most NFL – ability or NFL translatability, whatever. I think he definitely does. And I don't think it's close personally. He's made that one handed catch in a game. I've seen it. You know, we've seen that clip from Jackson state when he did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. So we know he's capable. Uh, he didn't know how fast he'd catch on to things or what his role might be, how, you know, how tough his role will be to learn. Maybe his role is simple because he's got that ability. You go, let's not do anything too crazy with him. Just throw it up. I mean, make it easy for him. He's that kind of guy. And that, that in turn makes it easier for Peyton Thorne when he's in there or Robbie Ashford, whoever the quarterback is. So I think that is a huge development from Saturday. I think that is the main thing I would hang my hat on from what we learned on Saturday. Yeah, I think him and uh, I think guys like him, guys like Jair Shorter, guys like Revolta Fairweather, they just um, – they, they, they widen the margin of error – in terms of how accurate the pass needs to be, um, you know, maybe the route isn't exactly precise, but when you're six four and you've got length, it can make up for it. Maybe the ball's a little high. That's okay. Shane Hooks will go up and make a play. That ball clearly, if, if you're six four and you got to jump up and one hand it, ball sailed a little bit, but he made a play. And so right. guys like that just uh, they 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 widen the margin of error a little bit. Where when you don't have those players, that margin of error is really small. Um, and, and hooks, it hooks just got to become, you know, more consistent. Um, Hey, real quick, let's talk about, uh, game time.co real quick, a sponsor of ours, game time.co tickets for sporting events, comedy shows, concerts, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, game time.co go check them out for like last minute tickets and things like that. Um, and if you go get tickets through them and go find, uh, same section, same row tickets from somebody else. They'll give you a 110% refund on the difference. So they'll kind of protect there against uh, you feeling like you got a bad deal, things like that. GameTime.co, go check them out. If you use the code War Eagle, you get 20% off. I think your first purchase. So War Eagle, one word, 20% off your first purchase. GameTime.co, go check them out. Um, all right, I think the other thing to take away from, from the scrimmage on Saturday, Cole, and really probably the last um, few days, this is one of the things we saw Thursday during the full practice um, was the offensive line. And, and I mentioned it on the board. Actually, I wrote about it in, the, in our depth chart tracker like on Wednesday or Thursday or maybe Wednesday that <clears throat> Xavier Miller, who we've talked about, you've talked about him, I've talked about him having a good camp, um, all of a sudden got started getting reps with the first team right tackle, um, which then moved Britain to right guard and it moved Cam Stutz over to left guard. 
we started to see a little bit of that trickle out in practice that carried over into the scrimmage on Saturday, culminating in Hugh Freeze just straight up saying, the guy's really good and he's got to be on the field. And he talked about his flexibility. He talked about his power. He straight up was like, we need, we need to recruit more guys like that. Um, and so Xavion Miller's emergence has strengthened this offensive line tremendously. And it just gives you potentially gives them the ability to get the best five on the field, which now could include Miller. Whereas before it was Jeremiah Wright at that left guard, Cam Stutz at that other guard. Um, and then, so, so, I mean, I think the offensive line, I think Miller's emergence is big time. It gives them what appears to be now they got, I would say, I mean, I would say six. If you, if you think Tate John, if you're, if you think Tate Johnson's reliable, you're at seven. If you think Jaden Muskrat's reliable, you're at eight. If you think Connor Lou, and he's a true freshman, but we've heard good things. That's now you're potentially up to nine, like, offensive lineman that you feel good about putting in the sec so I, I ask you when you go left to right dylan wade jeremiah Wright, avery jones cam stutz gunner Britton. that's the line that it's been for most of the time Xavier miller's emergence creates a line that looks like dylan wade cam stutz avery jones gunner Britton at right guard Xavier miller at right tackle and then you're bringing Tate Johnson, Jaden Muskrat off the bench. Do you think there's a dramatic difference in those two? What does Xavier Miller bring to the table for you? And just kind of what does his emergence mean for now? It seems like you, you got two different lines that you could completely look at as a first team group. I don't think it changes too much. Um, in some offenses, if you moved Britain down to guard, he probably would not be very good. Um, I think he. I think with this offense, if just from what I know, and of course we haven't seen the game, so I, I can't tell you how exactly it's going to be. But I know they have done a lot of cross training, and the reason for that is because a guy like Gunnar Britton, who may not be as strong of a run blocker as some of these other guards, he can translate to guard – almost as easily as you can to tackle in this offense because it's a lot of finesse, right? So they're not asking them to blow people off the ball. I don't I don't expect that. Every once in a while, maybe, but it's not going to be a, a, a continual thing. So moving him to guard it is It looks not like huge. Gus – But uh, sorry, just on that point, it looks like kind of what you got with the Gus offense. Like it was just a lot of – use tempo to your advantage and just yep. move – go forward and, and then let the running back find find some space kind of sometimes. Well, the whole reason that the zone running game became such a big thing in, in the world of football is because people realized it, it's like trying to put a square in a round, you know, square peg in a round hole when you have an offensive line who cannot beat the opposing defensive line, who can't right. move them. So zone helps you, you know, create zones for your running back to make the decision. Yeah. That was the point of it. That's why so many teams run it because they don't want to rely on their offensive line to push the defensive line around. Really. When you get to the Georgia and Alabama level of offensive lines, they can do it, okay? They still run zone two. So that's a lot of what they're going to be doing. Uh, they're going to throw some gap scheme in there where you do need to push them around a little bit, but it's not going to be that prevalent. So I think that's a good move, getting him there and getting him some work. The reason is because I think Isaiah Miller, too tall, is the guy who is going to be the backup at right and left tackle. I think if the left tackle goes down, he's going in. I think if the right tackle goes down, he's going in. I really think he's the next guy. Uh, I don't know that, but I feel like he is, just from everything we've heard. It's a fair assumption. I mean, he, I mean, if he, if you think he's if he's that good, and the point is to get your best five, then he, yeah. Assuming he he, there's nothing we're not understanding about. Like, well, on the left side, he struggles with the step or something like that, but. Yeah, I, mean, I think or, that's a fair assumption. You just saw what might happen if, you know, somebody goes down, then you can move somebody to left tackle and then put him in at right tackle and put – you know, you, there's a lot of different yeah. things you can do now, and that's what yeah. we're trying to figure out. And that's what you're talking about with having not, almost nine guys you can really count on. That's big. That's can we big. just take – like, can we just – can everybody just take just take a minute and appreciate that? Like, yeah. And we, we haven't seen him. We haven't seen him. 
But I think from what we've heard, seeing you look at where they came from, look at some tape a little bit. I think I think it's a pretty good pretty good group there of almost a two deep. But but like we said, eight to nine guys. That's it's it hadn't always been like that the last couple of years. We, we'll say that for sure. Uh, no, definitely not. And by the way, I put I you know covering recruiting, I put a lot of stock in JUCO guys uh, when they're coming into a, a setting like this and and they're new to a, a an Auburn or you know an SEC school. No. Junior college players are not SEC level players, but the speed is much better than high school. I can assure you that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I feel like JUCO guys get slighted a lot in rankings. I don't really understand why that is because they're usually more ready to play when they get to college. And uh, I think that's the case for Miller. I think he was really good on the JUCO level, and now he's you know he already knows the speed of the game. He was there in the spring. That helps too. So yeah, he's he's going to get a shot, man. I I don't know if he's going to start. But one of the questions I asked Jake Thornton when we had him on the round table was, hey, at Ole Miss, you had two starters that were freshmen. And by the way, at one of those spots, right tackles where Mason Brooks was supposed to play. I don't know if you remember that name. That was a guy that Auburn recruited pretty heavily from Western Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. Um, he he picked Ole Miss. He picked Ole Miss. Jake Thornton got that one. And the guy didn't start for him. He started a freshman instead. So – that was a big loss for Auburn. Ended up not even starting at Ole Miss. It was Micah Pettis, and Micah Pettis was a freshman All-American. So my point was, and I asked Jake Thornton this, you know, what is your philosophy on starting younger guys over maybe an older, maybe veteran-looking, you know, type guy? And he's like, I start the best players. Simple as that. And a lot of coaches say that, but he actually did it at Ole Miss. So I think that's something to watch too. Yeah, I was looking up Xavier Miller. Um who, by the way, if if you're curious about, you know, Jake Thornton, you know, Jake Thornton had Miller committed to Ole Miss, correct? Yes, he did. Right. So if you're thinking about Jake Thornton and and, and maybe his ability to evaluate talent and recruit, this is a kid who was was in line to go to Ole Miss with Jake Thornton. He had already recruited him there, and then he followed Jake Thornton to Auburn. But, yeah, for those who are a little unfamiliar with Miller, I mean, Juco All-American, he was a 2022 J.C. Gridiron preseason first-team All-American. He was a top 12 Juco player on on three or top 10, whatever it was. Highly highly recruited kid, big-time kid, 6'5", 318. And I was looking, um, I believe, that high school is from – yeah. So I I was looking at his profile, Wooddale High School in Memphis – same high school that Javon Robinson from, by the way, back in the day, Auburn fans remember Javon Robinson um, from Wooddale. So yeah, Miller, and there's a picture, man, you go look at go to AuburnLive.com and I put up 10 offensive and defensive standouts. Miller's included in that. But if you go look at the picture I included, there's a picture from him where he's blocking against Elijah McAllister. And I think it really shows Miller's length, man. Cause McAllister's not, McAllister's long. McAllister's six, yeah, he's- four, Long, maybe six five, long arms, and you look at Miller, and he looks bigger than McAllister. I mean, he looks. But Miller looks six six, and carries that three twenty really well to be six six, and has those long arms. I mean, that is a. I mean, he he looks a lot like Sean Coleman looked kind of back in the yeah. day. Just a big, big, tall, uh, carries the weight really well, um, offensive lineman. And so, I'm just excited potentially about the options there. You just get you got to see it come to fruition. But with Miller's emergence, I mean, you heard Hugh Freeze. If that's the case, if it's like, hey, we can't keep this guy off the field, um, yeah, you basically have two really good options as a first-team offensive line, and then you still got some guys right there um, that could that could back him up. It turns into a battle in left guard if it's Jeremiah Wright or Cam Stutz, and you put Miller in. So, um, yeah, I think that was really, I think that was really, really good news too to hear about Shane Hooks for sure. But I think the Xavion Miller emergence. Uh, coming out of Saturday was was awesome to hear. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier that I wanted to just mention was they've run the ball pretty well defensively, and Hugh Freeze mentioned it. They've got to get some guys back. So scrimmage on Saturday, Austin Keys didn't play, Jalen McLeod didn't play. That's your two best box defenders. Didn't play. Uh, Keldrick Falk didn't play. Um, and then so I mean so defense has got to get defense has got to get healthy. Um, I think Larry Nixon, Cam Riley out there. Larry Nixon might be 
I'm still not sure where Cam Riley's at. I don't know where Wesley Steiner's at. I still think Larry Nixon might be your most reliable linebacker along with getting keys back in there. Um, we'll see what Asante does with his chance to shine. Good things from the DBs. We heard Hugh Freeze said that, that those dudes had a great week of camp, that Nehemiah and DJ James stepped it up, which, by the way, we talked about that. We kind of called that. We talked about that earlier in camp where Freeze was kind of he, – he had some comments sort of challenging the defensive backs, and we were like, it feels like he wants more from that group. Like, you're a bunch of veterans – we, I mean, we literally said that. We were like, it feels like he's saying, hey, you guys are supposed to be this veteran good group. Go do it. And he, and that's exactly what he said on Saturday. He said he challenged them and said, You're, you guys could be all conference. Well, go practice like it. Yeah. Uh, go do it. And that, so that I think we read into that right about some of the comments he was making about those DBs. Sounded like they stepped up and had a really good week of practice towards the end there. Good, good last scrimmage. Um, so I, I think the DBs are in a good place. But that front seven to me – is still the big question mark. Not necessarily because we've heard about Auburn running the ball well. Like, kind of all all fall camp, certainly the two scrimmages, Freeze has come out and said, we, we ran the ball well. We ran the ball well. That's good, but it, as he always said, that's good, but what does it mean for the run defense? What what, what is it, Does it mean it's a dominant run offense, or does it mean that the run defense has got some issues? I think it's a little of both. I think the offensive line is getting better, but I, I, see, some, I see some issues – with that front seven, they got to get keys back out there because he's missed now a full, a few practices. He didn't just miss one. He's probably missed three. Fox missed, I think two um, recently. And so you got to get those two guys. And then of course, Jalen McLeod, who's went practiced a little bit on Thursday. I don't, didn't scrimmage, got a right, his, his right ankle was taped up, maybe a sprain, maybe something like that. But those, yeah. those guys got to get out there. They got to get them healthy over the next three, four days, and they got to be good to go this next week and a half going into the season. It probably explains some of the pass rush and why it was maybe not as good. You didn't have Falk. Maybe. You didn't have McLeod. Um, even Austin Keys probably helps with that some. But, um, you know, the defense to me has is – it's weird how it's flipped. I mean, I was more worried about the offense last mm-hmm. year and going into – Spring, I was going defense. I, I'm a little worried about the more transfer portal pickups they got. I was going, wow, well, okay, offense might be decent. Like I, I, I feel a little bit better about the offense than I do about the defense, um, just because I, I saw some glaring areas with the defense that needed, you know, help. And I think they got some good, you know, new talent to go there. But I just don't know what to expect from those guys yet. I liked Larry Nixon's film. I loved Austin Key's film. I think he's the real deal. He needs to be healthy. Mm-hmm. That's an important piece, if you ask me. I think Jalen McLeod is arguably the most important piece of the defense. Uh, I think he helps the secondary as good as they are. I think they get better when he's on the field. So, those to me, those two pickups right there, and then Justin Rogers in the middle, we know that he's going to be – I know he's going to be good, Okay. He's had some, I guess, I don't want to call them issues, but maybe some times where they didn't expect him to do a little bit more. Here's my thing on that, by the way. He's a plugger, okay? Nothing about what he does is supposed to be flashy. So if you're expecting him to make these flashy plays, I don't I don't think you're expecting the right things here. He He's not supposed to be that. He's supposed to do the dirty work. He's supposed to take up double teams and do that kind of stuff. And if he's doing that, he's doing his job, and everybody on, on the defense is better because of it. So uh, I think he'll be fine because I've seen him do it 100 times on film. And then uh, Jason Jones is a guy that's emerged too. So a lot of pieces there I think are coming together. I think it's going to be okay. I just I have a few concerns still. Yeah. I think you're right about Jones and Rodgers. I mean – the fruit of their labor is going to be seen if the linebackers are making tackles yes. and running free. That That's the fruit of that. And you want to see Jones and Rodgers. I want to see them a yard in the backfield. I want to see them move the line of scrimmage immediately. When they when that ball is snap, they need to, they need to, they need to move the line of scrimmage. They're too big to not, if they're playing, if, the, if they don't move the line of scrimmage and they're just, they're just doing this, that's a waste to me. And they're with their size. They need to be boom push him back and they need to create a new line of scrimmage on the, on the other side. And then, you, you know, those linebackers can run the ball. That that's what you want to see. They don't have to make the tackle, but I want to see when you watch a play, you ought to be able to point out like, 
oh, he had to bounce it because, you yeah. know, Jason Jones is freaking like, exactly. you know, a yard and a half in the backfield or Justin Rogers, a yard and a half in the backfield. Um, that's what you want to see from, from those guys. And they've got the size to do it. You just got to go, you got to go do it. And you're right about McLeod. I don't know, like McLeod, we've talked about him, his ability to pass rush, but keys when you think back to Roberts talking about it being a linebacker driven defense, and then you think about keys being the guy at the mic, man, he's, 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 he's incredible. I mean, it sounds like he's sort of that guy. He's going to be the number one, Mike. Yeah. He's in, now he's incredibly important. He's the best box linebacker from what I understand. He's physical. And then of course he's the mic. He's calling things. So man, he, you, you literally just played your last scrimmage without your two most important players on defense. I would yeah. say and Austin oh, keys yeah. and Jalen McLeod. So those guys got to get, uh, those guys got to get back up there. You, you mentioned something about kind of being concerned about offense, defense, and I'm kind of with you. And I don't know why, because the offense has got question marks too. They got receiver question marks. And do the receiver, receivers and quarterback have to be on the same page? That's that's going to take game reps. Peyton Thorne hasn't done it. Has it we, haven't, we, haven't, we haven't played this offense yet. Like there's question marks there. I guess I just think – I think the system on offense – um, can be suited towards overcoming a talent gap with tempo, let's say, right? Like tempo, we're going to go tempo and that's going to even the playing field a little bit, or um, this RPO kind of evens the playing field a little bit. I, I guess that's why I think maybe the ceiling on the offense is higher. I said this on the board, so people disagree, which is totally fine. I, I, I just think the ceiling on the offense is a little higher because they can use tempo or the option stuff to make up for if there's a talent gap or if, if they don't quite, not quite where they want to be, there's some things they can use to their advantage defensively. If that front seven, there's no, there's no sugar coating that there's no tricking. There's no scheming. Like if that's not where it needs to be, you are going to get run on and you can't get, I mean, all you can do is load the box, which, which then makes you, you know, vulnerable in other areas. And so that, that's why I just, I lean towards being more, worried about that front seven and the defense as a whole. Cause I think there's ways the offense can, can, uh, can maneuver around some of the, some of the, some of the gaps that they have defense. It's not and the front seven better be there and the depth better be there. And I'm just not sure it's where it needs to be. And that's hard to cover up. Yeah. And, and it's funny, the defensive line, the front seven, when it comes to taking on a double team, that's the easiest uh, it's it's the easiest thing to wrap your head around. All right, you got the double team. They're about to combo you. You have to fight through it. You, you just got to win. When it comes to receiver and stuff like that, quarterback, obviously, oh, if this guy does this, you got to do this. And it's totally different on both sides of the ball. So it's not like they're trying to learn it. It's it's just executing it and trying to be, you know, close to perfect with it. Don't ever get driven back or you will get beat, you know, that kind of thing. So I think uh, from what I've seen, the evidence that's out there on these guys, I think Jason Jones struggled a little bit last year, but we've heard that he's gotten much better at this job. And, and then I didn't see Justin Rogers struggle at Kentucky, and we know who who he played against at Kentucky. He played against all the teams he's about to see again. Yeah. So that gives me enough confidence that he's going to handle that. And I have some confidence in Jason Jones now too because of all the good things I've heard about him. So I feel pretty good about that spot. Um. And then and I, I like the evidence I see on Peyton Thorne. I do. I really do. I mean, you can listen to all these rumors or whatever. Oh, he, you know, he struggled in the first scrimmage. Oh, you know, somebody at Michigan State might have been beating him out. Well, you can believe that and you can run with it, but I don't take that. I, I go watch the film. There's there's tons. There's probably thousands of snaps he's played football in a big-time game. And I've graded it uh, twice now. One thing I have noticed about him – and this is going to help Auburn's offense a lot, I think, especially with the way they're going to call plays, I think, is he doesn't make many wrong reads. If if it's a bad play, it's because he didn't make the most accurate throw or he was pressured or something like that. The read's usually right. And in this offense, that is going to reign supreme, making the right read, I think. I think they're going to scheme them open pretty good. I think you now have a couple of guys like Fairweather and Hooks, like we talked about, who can make things happen when there's nothing there. I think Damari Austin, Jarquez Hunter could be those guys too. So, you know, I, I kind of have some confidence there that they're going to be better than decent, at least. Yeah. Yeah, Thorne went uh, 
Thorne went 12 of 17 on Saturday, two touchdowns, one pick. The pick wasn't his fault. The receiver fell down, um, talked to somebody who was, who was there. So the receiver fell down. That wasn't really his fault. So, so two touchdowns, 12 of 17. By the way, I, I quickly looked up Peyton Thorne played um, over 1,500 snaps at Michigan State. So yeah. quite a few, quite a few snaps under his belt. Yeah. Um, thousands that was accurate i said thousands that i yeah, was, yeah. thought i might be exaggerating but that is accurate. no no yeah he played set, nearly 800 snaps the past two years both years um yeah 12 of 17 i mean look you'll uh the past couple of years you would you would you'll take that in a heartbeat at, at, for a quarterback the last yeah. two years even even Bo at times 12 of 17 was like was yeah. good it's been a while i mean that's that's you'll take that you'll take that all day um he said the first two possessions he said he he didn't like decisions he made on the first two drives, and then after that he was good. So maybe a little bit of carryover from the first scrimmage, maybe a little bit of nerves pressing, and then he settled in, and he said he was really good um, and made some plays. Robbie was eight of fifteen, two touchdowns, no picks. So that's no interceptions for Robbie in the in 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 and really you know from the defensive standpoint, just one just one turnover in two scrimmages and it was a receiver falling down. I will say to that point, I think Auburn's offense and at the same time, Auburn's offense only one turnover in two scrimmages. I think this is more about Auburn's offense. The way this thing is, is set up this RPO game. You understand this, but it's it, the turnover should be low because yeah. you're taking what the defense gives you. If yeah. you're turning it over, you are forcing it. Where that's where it's not there. Like you, you, you should not be turning it over much. It's going to happen, obviously. But this offense is, I'm going where the defense is not, literally. And so there really shouldn't be a lot of turn. Peyton Thorne should not throw 12 picks this year. It shouldn't. It shouldn't happen. Um, I think he's he's done. He threw 24 in three seasons at Michigan State. That number should not be. I mean, he should. It should be low. And so even for Robbie, it should be low because you're you're either dumping it or you're running it or handing it off or whatever. So. Um, and, and, and also to say that about the defense, not, I'm not, I don't think there's anything you can read into the defense, not creating turnovers in the two scrimmages, because again, you're playing an offense that it's designed. It's really hard. It's like playing a, it's like trying to press a basketball team or play a basketball team that just plays a certain style. And it's just hard to, you know, to create things, to create ways for them to, to make mistakes. You, it's, it's tough. So the turnover yeah. thing, I wouldn't read much into the defense. And I think offensively, because of the way they play, turnovers should be low, which would be nice because the last two years under Harson, it's been a turnover a game Ooh, yeah. um, and a lot of a, multiple turnovers in many games. And like half the games, they were turning it over two or more times. So hopefully that turnover aspect should be much lower with this offense. They should not be giving the ball away. I wanted to give some credit to Robbie Ashford, too, uh, for what I heard about him at the scrimmage. It sounds like he took – you know, losing the quarterback battle well. And, and that was what we talked about in the last podcast was it was right after Freeze had said, you know, if Robbie Ashford handles this well, then he can be a big asset to our team. Well, sounds like he bounced back pretty well. He, he's playing well. Uh, I heard good things about him at practice. Uh, so, you know, credit to him on that. I think that was uh, an answer to the call from Freeze there. And I, I, I haven't heard much about Gurner, just to be honest. Yeah, I think he was seven for 11, didn't really – I mean, he's third. He's third. He's got good potential, but he's still absorbing. I mean, Hugh Freeze laid, out, laid it out with Kerner. He's still absorbing. I mean, I think, you, I think you can read into that and you can understand what he's saying. Talented kid, still absorbing, meaning still makes a lot of mistakes and, yeah. and decision-making and things like that. I think with Robbie, my own personal opinion, I think it's – I think he's still – I think he's still a, a wait and see for me. Um, I think, uh, I think immediately after the decision, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how he handled it. I, you know, eight of 15 Saturday seemed like he did some good things. He's just an up and down kid. So for me with Robbie, show me, show me the next two weeks leading into the first game. Show me the, the, once the season starts that you are committed to being the backup but committed to your role, whatever that role is. And, and that you're not, you know, I, I don't want to hear about stuff in practice about you pouting or, or getting mad because you don't get a shot or whatever the circumstance might be. Like 
he's he's his his track record is against him. He's got to show me that um, he can handle it the right way long term. Um, winning games will help. <laughs> that would help everybody. Obviously, that would help somebody like Robbie if he's yeah. if he's coming in and has a part of winning games. That would be huge. If he's coming in and having a role in losing games, we'll see how he handles that. Um, but you've got to give him a chance. I think that's what Hugh's doing is he's giving him an opportunity to handle it the right way. And he's been very transparent, like you said, about if he handles the every time he's praised Robbie the last two days, three days, it's it's with a caveat if he handles it the right way. And so I think I think that's straight talking to Robbie Ashford. Yeah, I don't think that's talking to us necessarily. Uh, I think that is more of a message to Robbie Ashford probably to like hope hope that he reads that and hope that he hears that um, because it's on you, right? He's telling him the same thing in private, sure. but uh, it's I think it's a message. Um, let's end on this. Fall camp wraps up, um, and then now we're, we're about to be into game week, which is crazy. With UMass coming up on Saturday, uh, on on September second, two Saturdays, two weeks. What um, what are kind of some takeaways from fall camp? Either things that you feel like you have a better understanding of, whether it's a player or you're more confident. Maybe you're less confident in another area. You come out of fall camp with a question mark that you didn't have before. Um, what are kind of some thoughts for you? On kind of both sides, both sides of the aisle, a little bit of pro, a little bit of con after after two weeks of camp and this team getting closer to this first game. Um, I think I'm a little bit less confident about the linebacker group as a whole now than I was going in. Uh, I, I think the carousel of guys is not a great sign. Of course, I mean, you're going to have that. It's part of, you know, pre-football. Fall camp. That's part of it. You got to try different guys, but I haven't heard about enough guys emerging as a, you know, the guy. Austin Keys. After that, we've heard good things about Asante. We've heard good things about Nixon. You know, Steiner at times. I hear nothing about Cam Riley. If I'm being completely honest, I don't know why that is. Um, so it's it's like some of these guys like that. I'm, I expected to hear more from Cam Riley. I expected to hear more from Steiner. Uh, you know, I expected to hear more from Nixon, and, and we're starting to a little bit now, uh, but it took a minute. So that tells me that it's probably a case of we're not sure who the next guy really is beside Austin Keys. There's going to be some rotation there before we really figure out, oh, he's the guy. So I, I thought it would be a little bit more cut and dry than that going in. That's one thing. Uh Second thing I would say, I think Hugh Freeze knew it was Peyton Thorne the whole time, but he tried to have a real competition and convinced himself, hey, you know, he's not he's not the starter. Let's see how he does with all this. I think that was true, but I think he knew in the back of his mind this is – I've seen enough of him to know he can probably do it. Um, and then another thing I would say, I ranked the position units going into fall camp, and I'm going to do it again after. I think – I had running backs number one, and I think that holds true right now. I don't think anybody has knocked them out of the number one spot in my mind. Yeah. Especially when you talk to Carnell. I mean, you know, he, he, he thinks it's not that it's been like some amazingly, you know, it's not like it's been some awesome run of loaded running back rooms the last few years, but he thinks it's the deepest they've been in, in a handful of years. I, I agree. It's probably yeah. the most reliable and versatile room. Well, you think sure. you could you could go against UMass and give it to Sean Jackson thirty times, and you'd probably still I mean you'd probably still win big, right? You yeah, don't yeah. lose too much, and he's what the fourth string guy, probably. Well, fifth? I mean fourth or fifth. Jeremiah Cobb talking to yeah. somebody after Saturday. I was talking to somebody on staff Saturday um, after the scrimmage, and he goes, he goes, man, Jeremiah Cobb. Like is the real deal. He's like he we he could play running back. We could put him on every special teams. Like he's he's uh the skill sets there. The 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 body the size is already there. He's he's like he's been the real deal. He's been good. Yeah, sounds about right. He looks the part now. I, I I've you know thought that every time I've seen him out there. Um, 
he's really, you know, put on some good weight there, and that was what he needed to do. I thought that was the number one thing he needed to be able to play in the SEC. So he's done that, in my opinion. He's close to 200 pounds. I think he's a guy that you might see some of. But, again, I ranked him number one. I haven't seen anybody knock them out of that spot if I'm doing the re-ranking. Yeah, I remember you doing that, and I would agree with you. I think that's uh, I think that's the best the best position group for sure. Um, yep. what else? Anything else catch your eye? Um, not really. Uh, that those are the main three things that that came to mind. So, uh, you know, if I thought really hard about it, there'd be other things, but those are the main three things I'd say. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious, and and we'll. We won't dive into it. We'll, we'll make sure you go to auburnlive.com and check out when Cole re-ranks. I'm looking at it now. You had running back one, tight end two, O-line three, quarterback four, corner five, receiver six, defensive line seven, jack eight, linebacker nine. Not great when you go defensive line seven, jack eight, linebacker nine, safety nickel ten, all on defense. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll let you kind of think about how you're going to re-rank them and you'll, you'll do that on the website. I, I would probably say, I agree with you. Running back comes out one, probably move line offensive line to two, just because of some, some, some options there. Um, well, you have to remember, you, even though we kind of in our mind don't, you have to count Fairweather as one of the tight ends, you know? Yeah, no, 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 for sure. I just yeah. like, I like the emergence of Miller. I like Muskrat. Um, I think the yeah. line got better as a whole and Miller Miller's emergence is like, okay. I mean, you could, yeah. so I just, I like what they're there, but I'm not sure I would change a lot. We'll, we'll see what you do. Um, Jack probably moves up. A cloud is the real deal. Steven Sings has done well. Yeah. Callister is going to have his role. So that Jack position probably moves for me ahead of the defensive line. Um, cornerback at cor- that corner position is probably, that might move. I, I don't know, you could. It might move ahead of ahead of quarterback. I mean, just because yeah. maybe some some guy. It feels like Champ Anthony had a pretty good camp, and yes, obviously and K, and, K and Lee and Colton Hood got a little better. Like cornerback, maybe maybe looks pretty deep. That might get a, a bump up, but because uh, that was the um, reason I put them at number five. Because yeah, obviously DJ James is strong. Nehemiah Pritchett strong. We think K and Lee's pretty strong, but after that, who was it? I mean, you're gonna have to have yeah. somebody else. So that was my thinking there, but it sounds like there's a couple options now. Yeah, but I think it's pretty close. I'd probably go running back one, O-line two, tight end three, corner four, quarterback five, and then everything else. I I mean, I'd probably go jack six, receiver seven, linebacker eight, defensive line nine, safety nickel ten, something like that. And and, – it's it's I hate to have safety that high because Jalen I think is a really good player. Sure. Puckett's a really experienced player. I don't think he's the best player, but he 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 get he's got high football IQ. He gets it. Yeah. Um. I just don't know about the depth. Well, now Kaufman that safety nickel probably needs to go up because Keontae is going to be fantastic yep. in the nickel. Right. Sylvester Smith's got a little potential. Kaufman now gives you maybe a little bit more depth at safety. So that position probably to me is is ahead of. I probably feel better about that position than I do the defensive line, probably even linebacker. So I'm probably moving them up a little bit as well. Um, I I think um, I think the takeaway for me or anything that I I probably have more questions about that front seven than going in, um, yeah. just because I don't love the depth at the defensive line position. I, I don't. I just I don't love. I think Marcus Harris is a good player. Yeah. I think Jason Jones and Justin Rogers have got to show me. I think they've got potential, but I don't think they've reached their potential. And then behind Marcus Harris, you're hoping that Lawrence Johnson from Purdue, I think he is what he is. He's he's a probably a decent player that helped Auburn add depth. I don't think he's anything spectacular. Can he be a good two guy in the SEC? We're, we're about to find out. Um, and you know, Nasili Kite. Potential, good leverage. Let's see it in the SEC. Keldrick Falk looks the part, but he's a true freshman. There's just a lot of questions that, that nose tackle, defensive tackle, defensive end. When you think about what it what it takes to to hold your own in the SEC and and not and stop the run against Georgia, Bama, LS, LSU, Arkansas, like 
you better have some studs right there and you better have a bunch of them to rotate. I think Auburn's probably what they're going to need to do is on that defensive line is I don't think they have a stud. So I think they're going to have to rotate everybody. They're going to have to say, we don't have a the one guy. So, but maybe we've got a bunch of okay guys. But we're just going to play them all. Like maybe, maybe if we can rotate as many as we can, maybe a little bit of freshness can yeah. help make up for, not having a stud because you can't play Marcus Harris can't play the amount of snaps he did last year. No. You know, Colby Wood, Colby Wooden's gone. He played a, just a million snaps. So they're going to have to rotate. And without having that stud, maybe Nasili Kite, Falk, Lawrence Johnson, Jones, Roger, maybe there's a rotation there of, of just kind of being able to hold your own. Maybe that can be their strength. So they get, get to the second half of games, but that defensive line, I probably come out with with more questions than answers, and I probably come out feeling the feeling better about probably the offensive line. I mean, I didn't think they were a, a bad group, but I remember writing on the site. I remember writing when I talked about the offensive line, just saying, "Hey, look, I, I get that they're going to be better probably, but you know, look, Avery Jones coming from East Carolina. East Carolina is not the SEC." Uh, Gunner Britton, Western Kentucky, not the SEC. Tulsa, not the SEC. Um, and so it's like, yeah, you get these guys that were that had some options in the portal and are going to start right away, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything when you're coming in and you already had a depleted line anyway. Like there's some context there. So I, I just I was a little bit not skeptical, but I just wanted to see more. But I like what I've heard from that group, like the emergence and the development of a couple of guys, and I feel better about that offensive line now that there's some options. Jade Muskrat, you heard that he had a really, you know, that he had a really good camp. Yeah. Obviously Xavion Miller, Connor Lou, really interested to see, is he the real deal? Could he, he even got work at guard a little bit. I think those last couple of practices as an option. Um, So I just, I like the development there. And I think there's more options leaving camp from the offensive line. There's more options than when you, than when you entered, I would say there's more reliable options. There's more options that you feel pretty good about than I think going into camp. So that's probably my probably my pro and con is the trenches. One good and one bad in the in the trenches leap and fall camp for me. One more for me is uh, I'd say I feel a little bit better about the pass rush right now. I think the pass rush is going to be okay. I was a little bit worried about them. So yeah. Just need Jalen McLeod to stay healthy. Yeah. <laughs> he, got... Without him, I feel bad again. But <laughs> with him, yeah. I think he, I think they're okay. And I think there's options. Like, I'm curious to see, does Cam Riley come in at times and, uh, on the weak side just to blitz? Does he, he you know, does – Keontae is going to be a fantastic blitzer. Yeah. Um, so, Key. there's some little – there's some things that, yeah, Key – I think there's some things Roberts can do, not just on McLeod, but where Cam Riley comes in and maybe McLeod and, and, and Riley are both coming off the edge and then Falk's coming – and then you know, Keontae can come from that nickel. I think there's some good options there to, because they're going to do it. They're going to try to blitz and wreak havoc, things like that. So, yeah. That seems to be a, uh, a staple of a Ron Roberts defense. They did blitz a lot when he was at Baylor. I've tried to dive a little bit more into his defense, and it's kind of hard to do. Defense is harder to break down, in my opinion, but he likes to dial it up. So they're going to have to have some extra blitzers there. And I think Austin Keys, Keontae Scott, Donovan Kaufman's good at it. These are some guys you can use for that role. Yeah. Um, All right, man. Well, we'll get back at it here in a couple of days. Auburn's taking a few days off. Class has started, I think, Thursday or Wednesday or maybe Thursday. But it's uh, they kind of get really cranking this week. So they're giving them probably Sunday, Monday off to get into the class schedule and get into the class mode get some players hopefully healthy. Hopefully some of those guys will, won't have to do anything for, you know, Saturday afternoon, Sunday, Monday, maybe even Tuesday. I'm not sure when they're going to get back on the practice field, but uh, that's kind of this time period we're in now is a sort of in between with classes starting and, and uh, getting cranked up for, for everything now is game prep. I mean, everything now is going to be game prep for UMass, probably a little cow sprinkled in there, I would assume. Yeah. Um, in that second game. So it's here, man. Fall camp's done. Season's here, dude. Um, shout out to Session Cocktail real quick. Our sponsor, Session, downtown Auburn, Magnolia Avenue. Go check them out. Right by Taco Mama. Happy hour, four to six. Awesome drinks. Great old-fashioned. 
uh, go 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 visit them whenever you can. For sure, during the season, go pop in on Saturday while you're tailgating and have a good drink at session cocktail. It's this hat. I think they're going to have some of these for sale there soon. So you'll, I think they're I think it's going to be blue and orange. So I think it's going to be a blue hat with orange um, little logo. So it's a cool little cool little hat you can go pick up at session as well. So that's it, Cole. We'll have a few days off, man. Recruiting, anything recruiting got going on next couple days? Yeah, you got Monday coming up. You got a, an announcement. Um, I will be there, Highland Home, Alabama, back to the uh, same place we were at a year ago with Keldrick, now with his little brother, G. Caleb. He will announce his commitment Monday at 6 o'clock. Nice. Ooh, yep. 6 o'clock, a little late evening announcement. Um, yeah. Sweet. I know you'll have uh, I know you'll blow that out. So so make sure to go to AuburnLive.com. Check that out. By the way, for people listening, um, I think on three has changed the way they're doing the trial periods where so if you're not a member, if you're listening to us on YouTube or podcast and you're not a member, um, I believe they have changed it up now. Um, they're going to offer an introductory price of one dollar for the first month. And then that will renew at the normal nine 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 ninety nine rate. Um, or you can do 75 bucks for a year and then that'll renew at the normal hundred dollar rate for new customers. So generally they would do a week free. I think they're going to start doing, um, you get a month for a dollar and, and then after that month it renews. So pretty freaking awesome deal. If you're not a member, if you're listening to us to go start, to go hop on, pay a dollar, hop on for a month, especially this first month, as things go rolling, recruiting and stuff, um, go hop on. And, and I think you'll, uh, you'll really enjoy the stuff. All right, Cole. Let's get out of here. Sounds good. All right. See you everybody next time. Bye.